We are now joined via Zoom by Professor Sarojini Nadar from the University of the Western Cape, where uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu served as Chancellor for 25 years. She will be uh, speaking to us about the Desmond Tutu Chair and Center for Religion and Social Justice. A very good afternoon to you, Prof. Uh, thanks very much for waiting while indeed we were taking some time there uh, with our reporter outside the home of the, the Archbishop. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Flo. Thank you for having me. I think a lot of people view the Archbishop as a religious man, as a man who helped to fight uh, apartheid. But, you know, Perhaps there's not enough spoken about his intellect and his intellectual capacity. And no better person or person positioned, really, than a representative of the university where he served as, as chancellor. Let's, let's talk to that. Let's talk to um, his intellectual capacity and really what he contributed in, in those long years that, that, that he was uh, chancellor. Thank you, Flo. Um, so, yeah, I think, as you point out, um, many know the Arch as a political priest. Um, but what is often left unattended in, um, in what we say about his legacy is the fact that he was deeply passionate about critical thinking and about a sound education. Um, he was the associate director of the Theological Education Fund at the World Council of Churches between 1972 and 1975. And in 2019, I had the privilege and pleasure to trawl through hundreds of his travel reports and funding proposals from the archives archives at, um, in Geneva in Switzerland. And what was evident um, through these letters and the, um, you know, his reports from his travel was his, his deep commitment to, um, to developing a student, not just spiritually, yeah. but um, critically and theologically. And so we often joke that um, he had a deep commitment and um, to priests not checking their brains in at the door when they got to the church. And so the, the chair and the center was inaugurated at UWC to, um, to honor this legacy, um, uh, his intellectual legacy, both um, in his time, the 25 years that he served as chancellor at UWC, both for that, but also to continue that legacy through the work that we do and the research that we conduct at the intersections of religion and social justice. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's exactly where I wanted to go. I mean, in terms of what students um, gained um, having, him, having him around, I mean, one would imagine that there was this holistic approach to, to, to education, which is beneficial uh, to any student, which isn't just about, you know, what, what marks you're getting, you know, how you're passing, but really a world and, 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 and worldly uh, view to life. I mean, let's talk about the sort of students that perhaps came out of that uh, university and, 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 and what, they, what he was able to, to really pass on. Well, I, I think that um, the UWC doesn't have um, uh, the name, um, uh, the intellectual home of the left for nothing. <laughs> I think uh, the Archer's uh, uh, involvement in the University of the Western Cape had a huge part to play. Um, but again, in the center and in the chair, what we're doing is trying to continue that legacy. So um, we have um, particularly graduate students, postgraduate students um, working in the areas of sexuality, economic justice, climate justice, um, working, um, studying the ways in which religious beliefs and norms um, impact on our actions for social justice. People often think that these two things are um, can and should be separated, mm -hmm. but I think what we have in the life and witness of Archbishop Desmond Tutu is not just um, the possibility that these two things are connected, but the imperative that it should be. And so um, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, he's, I, I've been uh, particularly um, interested in the past two days to see the number of um, uh, shares that we've had about the important th things that he, he, he has said about social justice issues. I, I've seen the meme uh, being shared over and over again. If um, I cannot go to a homophobic heaven, for example, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, God is not a Christian. And so I think that um, the more we, 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 we focus on this legacy, the, the, we, we have so much to be inspired by. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, you know, I'm, I'm actually sitting down looking on my screen and I've uh, just put up his Wikipedia page uh, very quickly uh, while we're having our conversation. And I'm seeing, I mean, there's so many honors that were bestowed um, upon him. I'm looking at, uh, you know, other universities as well, Columbia University, uh, Rural University. Um, I mean, there's so many, the Order of Companions of, of Honor uh, given by uh, Queen Elizabeth. He was uh, also given a, he became a, a fellow at the Kellogg uh, College, uh, College in Oxford. I mean, were these important to him? Were these things that he spoke about? I mean, I don't see him being very boastful about uh, some of these honors as some of us ordinary people would be. Um, but I mean, were they of significance? Were they things that, uh, you know, that were spoken about? I mean, I, I certainly, you know, looking at this uh, list of, of achievements. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah, I think a, a lot of the, the a lot of this remains obscured. Um, and the reason for that is, I, I know people say it over and over, and it's quite cliche to say it, but he really, truly was a man of great humility. Mm. I, I remember visiting with him in 2016 and telling him about a book project that we wanted to do, you know, honoring his life and on, honoring his intellectual legacy. And he laughed and he said, why would you want to do that? Um, you know, what, yeah. what could be so interesting about what I've produced? And, and I think that's, that's a, a real and a genuine humility. You know, it, it really isn't a false um, modesty. Um, but this year, we managed to actually do that book. And um, just in time for his, his um, 90th birthday, yeah. uh, we launched a book called Ecumenical Encounters uh, with Desmond Impilo Tutu. And basically, the book gathered voices from all over the world. World, um, uh, reflecting on his role and his actions for social justice. Mm -hmm. And I think what was so, um, so special about this book is that um, it captured a Desmond Tutu that, um, or it, it, it managed to move us away from that legacy that has fallen in hard times um, recently. You know, people thinking that maybe you know, um, his, it, it, there's the simplistic idea that all he ever wanted was racial reconciliation and that, you know, that they, there was a bit of selling out that happened. Yeah. What we see in this book is a, is a man who was deeply um, passionate and committed and angry and mischievously humorous. It's, it's a wonderful um, recollection of the ways in which he spoke truth to power. And I think that's what we have. Um, that's the legacy that we have. And um, that's the kind of legacy that we're trying to continue to promote um, in the center and in the chair. You know, I'm so interested in the word that you, you just uh, used because I think a lot of people are shying away from even talking about that where they, they there are some perceptions that he he sold out and and I, and I wonder you know how is that something that he acknowledged that that that, that you know that he, he spoke about and maybe um, just to add to that question how did he feel about the fact that you know he fought in this liberation and for the most part the majority of South Africans are perhaps even worse off um, uh, than they were and things should have certainly been worked out differently uh, for the majority of black people in, in South Africa and I, and I wonder as, as someone who was actively involved and really at the forefront and a person that we're honoring today as having been so involved in, in the struggle I mean it, that, that, that if, if it was something acknowledged it must be something that hurts, hurt him quite, quite a bit. Yeah, I, I, I imagine he would. I mean, I haven't had the opportunity to speak to him personally about that, but I certainly imagine that it would. At the same time, um, just from what we know about him and what we know about his work and his commitment, I think that he would have also... Um, uh, it, uh, he, he would have been keen for the world to know that what he did in that moment was what was needed for the country. The, the, um, the, the reconciliation narrative was deeply important. Um, but I think contrary to this 
to this narrative that we have of the, you know, the teddy bear of reconciliation. This, um, this, this archbishop who 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 didn't um, value hard talk. I think contrary to that narrative, we have in this book um, really real examples um, of his commitment to calling out injustice. Yeah when it was needed to. And I think, in particular, his, um, his commitment to the Palestinian struggle, for example, or his, uh, his commitment to um, the struggle for um, um, the recognition of sexual diversity rights uh, in the current moment, not in the past, not as a sellout. He, he worked within problematic norms, yes. So, for example, with the, uh, with the, uh, in the area of sexual diversity rights, I remember when I went to visit him in um, 2016, 2017, sometime, when I'd just taken up the position of the chair yeah. and he said to me what are you going to be doing in in you know as as part of the work in the chair and I said I, I'm not quite sure yet but I know I have to do, deliver an inaugural lecture and he said what will you speak about and I said I'm, I'm not quite sure but um, and he said he gave me um, some advice he said you know when I am given a task to speak and I'm not given a topic I usually ask and I'm going to say this in nicer terms because we are on television <laughs> he said I, I usually usually ask myself, what is grinding my gears most in this moment? Yeah, and when yeah. you speak about that, then you speak about what you are passionate about. Yeah. And what I was passionate about in that moment, due to a personal experience, was the issue of sexual diversity rights. And so I said to him, this is what I'm going to speak about. And he shared quite personally. He said he was quite, um, uh, you know, sad about the fact that he couldn't officiate at the wedding of his daughter, um, Mpo, at the time. And he said, you know, the church says I can give her a blessing, but I can't, I can't officiate because of course the church has official positions. And he said, um, so it, and he said in his characteristic humor, he says, it's quite silly, you know, there I am, what am I supposed to say? Am I supposed to say, hey, God, this is my daughter, you know, <laughs> bless her, yeah. you can bless her, but I can't do this officially. So I'm not asking you officially. Yeah. And, and it was hilarious. But at the same time, there was so so much deep and profound truth. And I often say to the students, um, this kind of profound reflection cannot be found just in books and cannot be, it, it, it comes from a, a place of deep embodied um, understanding and deep spiritual reflection. And at the same time, it comes from a deep, a, a, a place of um, uh, applied critical thinking on these on these things. So, uh, so sorry, I went around a little bit with that question. But I think to answer your question about whether it saddened him, yes, I think it did. Uh, I, I imagine it would have. But at the same time, I think that he he understood that we always work within problematic norms, and that we work we have to continue the work of justice from where we are. And and yeah, that that's what's important. Prophet's been an absolute pleasure uh, having this conversation with you and uh, hopefully we'll have more conversation uh, conversations uh, here with you leading up uh, to the funeral as we continue to honor uh, the archbishop thanks so very much for giving us your time here on SABC News